everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my latest historical happy hour. I'm so happy to have Nicola Harrison here. Her new book, The Showgirl, just came out in August and it's amazing. And I can't wait to talk to her about it. Thank you, Nicole. And I have my champagne. I just I just posted about it. So cheers. <laughs> cheers. I'll cheers you with my tea. <laughs> Tea's good. I know you're in California. What time is it there? Four o'clock. It's a little early. A little that's... early for happy hour. Yeah. So, so um, I'm going to start but with an intro. Um, originally from Hampshire, England, Nicola Harrison moved to California when she was 14. She studied literature at UCLA and received an MFA in writing at Stony Brook University. She's a member of the Writers' Room and has short stories published in the Southampton Review and Glimmer Train, as well as articles in Los Angeles Magazine or Orange Coast Magazine. She was in the fashion and style, she was the fashion and style staff writer for Forbes and had a weekly column at Lucky Magazine. She lives in California with her husband and two sons. This is your second novel. Your first one was Montauk, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. yes. Awesome. So why don't we just jump in and um, tell us about the premise of The Showgirl and what inspired you to write this story? Sure. Um, so The Showgirl, well, first of all, I, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you first what it's about. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, it follows the story of Olive McCormick, who's a young woman from the Midwest, and she's very talented as a singer and dancer, and she's determined to make it onto the stage as a Broadway star. And so she basically shows up in New York City unannounced and knocks on Florence Ziegfeld's door. And Florence Ziegfeld is the big Broadway producer. And she basically demands a role in his show. So we go on this fun wild ride with her and her ups and downs and her triumphs and her hardships along the way. Um, and we go from New York City's theater district to, down to the West Village, which is where all the Bohemians were and her friends, her artists' friends and poetry friends and um, poet friends. And, um, and then we also go up to the Adirondacks, which is in upstate New York, where they take the show on the road. Um, so it's a lot of fun and it all takes place in the roaring 20s. But of course, there's a love story involved. Um, she falls for this man, um, Archie Carmichael, who's the first man who whisks, you know, the first man who really um, appreciates her passion for success and her determination and she's you know she's a very independent modern woman and this is the first guy who really like appreciates that in her and so he whisks her off her feet and everything looks like it's gonna you know be a happy ever happy ever after um but she has a secret looming in her past that threatens to sort of derail all of that i'm not going to tell you what it is right now oh, <laughs> but, <no> spoilers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers, but she has to decide in the end if she's willing to give up the life that she loves for the man she loves yes yeah, excellent. I love the story and I loved, I hadn't read um, a Roaring 20, 1920s book in a while. So that was so fun. I loved all your deep little details, like the slang and the food and the drinks. And um, tell me about your research for the life, yeah. life in that late 1920s. This was like right before the depression hit. So. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I, when I started writing this book, I, I wasn't planning to write a book in the 1920s. I wasn't planning to write about a showgirl or a Ziegfeld Folly. Um, I had had been up to, or I had written about this, um, the, the Adirondacks, this place in the Adirondacks called The Pines. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a luxury resort that you can go and stay at now. It's like $2,000 a night. It's like really fancy. Wow. Um, and it used to be owned by, it was, it was owned by the Rockefellers and built as, as William Avery Rockefeller II's family compound. And they would go up there for the summers and, you know, it was this big compound where they're going to stay out. And now it's a hotel that they sort of try to recreate the feeling that it was then, you know, they have these cocktail parties at night, even though you're in the woods going hiking and everything, you have these cocktail parties at night that are kind of, sort of where you get all dressed up, just like they nice. used to do back in the day. And so I wrote about this for a, a little short article for a travel magazine. And I learned that there were more of these places called the Great Camps that, that were all built by these wealthy industrialists at the turn of the century. And there are several of them, and a lot of them have fallen to disrepair, and some of them that are now like hotels. And, um, I thought, you know, that's a cool place to set a story. So I'm, I'm gonna do that, but I'd never been to one and I'd never even heard of them before. So I went up to the Adirondacks with my husband and we stayed at another one called White Pine Camp, which is much more modest, not $2,000 a night. <laughs> um, and we went and stayed there and 
it's got like 13 different cottages and a tennis courts and a bowling alley and it's right on the lake and it's very picturesque and I was trying to think okay how, what could the story be and yeah we, we took a tour you know as you do yes, <laughs> like yeah, trying to yeah. look around thinking and we took a tour with this local historian and he's showing us all around and telling us all about it and then he mentioned that the original owner of this place White Pines Camp his wife was a Ziegfeld Folly girl oh and, wow yeah and I was like ooh, and I like look over at my husband and he's like <laughs> you know, he got the new. That's, that's <laughs> so, her in. Yeah. yeah. Tell me more. Tell me more. And he's the, the historian said, "Oh, she was a real party girl, and she used to invite all of her theater friends up from the city and throw these elaborate parties in the middle of the woods. And she used to insist that no one should go more than 500 feet without a drink in their hand. So she used to <laughs> parts along the hiking trails. <laughs> and oh I was like, gosh. she sounds like fun. Yeah. So." that was where it all started and then it went off in a totally different direction all about the Ziegfeld Follies and and the 20s and everything <laughs> oh so fun and so talk to me like about Olive the main character because she's she's feisty she's talented and sometimes foolish as people in their late teens early 20s are and yeah. um and I'm always interested in stories about women who are forging their own paths at a time that we're that was not where most women didn't so tell me about how you like came up with her as a character yeah so she's definitely feisty and ambitious just like you said um very determined and yeah she's definitely a flawed character you're as you're I was as I was writing it I was sort of thinking no don't do it don't do what you're gonna do no don't say that because she's gonna have a bad result but um but it was kind of fun to write a flawed character but yeah she you know so women had just got the right to vote in 1920 she was sort of embodied that whole independent woman of the 1920s, a, a true flapper, you know, she yes. was, she was determined, she was going to um, live life on her own terms, and she was going to go after this career, and yes, it was scandalous, and yes, they, they dressed, you know, very scantily clad, and just feathers, and yeah, <laughs> like really scantily clad, I'm yeah. surprised, <laughs> and so for her, you know, parents who were like from the Victorian era, it was horrifying to them, but she was actually a very talented and, and um, singer and dancer. So she, she's going after this dream to like, to like live this life and, and to perform and to be a success. And so, you know, it was kind of fun to write someone who's so determined, but who's going to ruffle a lot of feathers along the way, <laughs> literally. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, and that was actually my next question, like her relationship with her family was fraught with, especially with her father. And I think that added like a, a really like a lot of conflict and interesting drama and dimension to the story yeah you know? yeah yeah and conflict with her father and conflict with her mother and you know her mother is sort of like stands by her her father and so it's like she sort of has to choose am I gonna just go with what my family wants me to do which is you know find a nice man settle down be a good housewife have some kids or am I gonna really pursue this yes so she has to really choose between family and or you know what she wants to do with her life right right um so I thought Archie was such a great like love interest I thought he was dreamy so if if there was a movie version of the show girl who do you think would play Olive and who would play Archie oh I think about this all the time <laughs> <laughs> I know it's fun to think about so yeah I was thinking Emma Stone you said Lily uh, Lily James. Yes. And then the other one I thought of was um, the one who, in The Queen's Gambit. I oh, I always forget her name too. Joy Taylor, Taylor Joy, someone. I think she would be good too. And for yeah. Archie, um, I don't know, Hugh Jackman maybe? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause he's older. He's yeah. older. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That would be a good one. <laughs> There's a British actor who was in Downton Abbey, who I thought would be good too. And I don't know, I forget his name too. So tell me about your writing process, because I love hearing about other people's processes. And I find that people are listening to too. So, you know, in, in the writing world, there's plotters versus pantsers, writing by the seat of your pants or plotting and outlining. Like, are, are you somewhere in, in the middle? Or are you one or the other? Well, with both books, Montauk and The Showgirl, I've, I've known pretty much the beginning, the middle, and the end, but I, 
you know, but then I, but then I'm a pantser the rest of the way. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is where I'm going. And then I don't plot it out. Like I just write scene by scene. Um, okay. And I feel like for me, that allows me to be the most creative. Um, yeah. And it, it totally goes in different directions, like directions that I wasn't expecting it to go in. Like characters will come in, like with, um, with my, my book, Montauk, um, I had a character, Dolly, who was just going to come in and play like a, a, a walk-on role. And then she just ended up being like the best friend who sticks around the whole time. And it's so funny how that happens. You know, they just, they, when you're writing them and it's like, you like them and <laughs> they're so interesting. I love that. Oh, very cool. So, uh, so you, you're kind of in the middle then you're like, it's kind of a, yeah, you're, you're kind of a hybrid plotter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd like to be a plotter. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of playing with plotting and thinking, you know, it might be, maybe it'd be more efficient if I, if I plotted it out chapter by chapter. So I'm sort of playing around with it, but, um, but I think I'm a pantser at heart. <laughs> yeah, I think there's no wrong way. It's so funny how everyone has their own, you know, style of, you know, their, their own method and they kind of, it's just whatever works for you, whatever gets you to the end, you know, like right. I always say. Right. What yeah. gets you to the end, I think is, um, having the kids in school. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Yes. Oh that helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my oldest is in middle school and my youngest is now in a little twos program for preschool. So I'm like, I have, like, I just, that's my writing time. I just cherish yeah. time. There's not, yeah. Because this, it's sort of like, there's some sort of guilt associated with when they're not occupied or if you have to put them with a sitter or something. And it's like, and then if you don't, don't have a productive writing day, there's some guilt that, that I feel. There's some guilt oh. associated with it. I'm like, I didn't get, you know, I had the baby with the, a babysitter all day and like I didn't get good writing done it's, it makes me feel good so I like them to be in school <laughs> oh I completely agree and mine are older too but it's like it, it like just that kind of house is quiet they're occupied I just yeah you totally need it and it's been hard the past yeah. 18 months so yeah I hear you um <laughs> what do you what's what's the part of the writing process that you love and what's the part that you what's your least favorite part I love the research. I love just all the possibilities and just starting with a totally clean slate and like a glimmer of an idea and then just going down the rabbit hole and just, I do so much research. Um, half of it doesn't even make it into the book. Um, yeah. And then I totally put all of that research away when I start writing because I never want it to feel textbooky or clunky. You know, you just want it to feel like you're in the twenties and you're in the theater and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, I love that part, um, and I love the part when you're going, you know, it's like you've got yeah. the story down and you just like wake up in the morning, you can't Hello. wait, to, oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. slow, like that's the best part, so fun. Um, I think the hardest part is the beginning. Yes. Well, the very beginning is fun. You write the first like scene and you're like, oh, this is fun, but then thinking, thinking about how it's going to pan out, I yeah. can sometimes get myself a little worked up and a little anxious, like, oh, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. And um, there's a bit of anxiety in that early, very early stage. But then right. once you get past that then it, and you're flying, then it's really fun. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah. But the, the research for this particular book was really, was, was a lot of, it was very varied because um, I started researching the Ziegfeld Follies, obviously, because that's a huge yeah. part of it. And um I, one of the books I, I really referred to a lot was this book by a woman called uh, Doris Eaton Travis. And she was the youngest woman to ever be cast in the Ziegfeld Follies. And she wrote this memoir called um, The Days of, no, they're called um, The Days We Danced, My Theatrical Life. So she was 14 when she was cast to be in the Follies. And she wow. went on to live to be 106 years old. Wow. Yeah, and so for her 100th birthday, she went back to the New Amsterdam Theater where the where they performed the Ziegfeld Follies yeah. and she performed on stage and she's singing and dancing and she led a line of uh, conga a conga line of like 24 <laughs> showgirls and you can actually find it online if you look up Doris Eaton Travis 100th birthday you can see some video clips of her and she looks amazing I mean whatever she's doing I want to do <laughs> no kidding that's amazing I also should mention too like I loved your historical notes at the end and I loved how you listed some of your books that you used for research because 
I'm like, I need to do that because people are like, people are interested sometimes. Like, you know, you read the book and then you want to do a deeper dive into the history behind the story. And I think that yeah. that was smart. Yeah. And there's different parts of it because you might, somebody might be interested in that and the performance and the Broadway. And then other people might be interested in like a totally different aspect, like the Adirondacks, yeah. which yeah. is a whole other research part. Like I found out that uh, White Pines Camp, which, where I based one of the camps where they stay at for the summer, um, that that place was actually uh, President Coolidge's summer White House in 1926. Wow, okay. so he went up there with his staff and his security and he stayed there. And I dug up these letters from the, um, from the house, housekeeper that, uh, of that time. And so she's sending all these, she, I found all these letters that she sent back and forth to her family back home talking about what she was making for dinner, you know, what kind of food they were eating. Oh, and so cool. And where yeah. they were getting supplies from and what the rooms were like. And I was like, it was just a treasure trove. Such of, a treasure when you hit that, like it's like hitting the lottery as a researcher. I love that. Yeah, so, so good. So I love all that research. <laughs> Very cool. Um, on that note, like how, like, and I've always am interested in this question with other historical um, fiction writers. How, how do you find the balance between historical fact and the fictional story you're writing and you know what historical facts are sacred and where do you feel like you have more flexibility like what how do you balance that I feel like I'm constantly trying to balance that and I'm just always curious how other authors do yeah I mean I think that the the actual facts that happen like for example the stock market crash you know that you, you can't change the date on that you know that's a thing <laughs> right. that happened. The big picture stuff yeah yeah picture, like that has that's firm and you know, and that is how I decide on the timing of, of the novel. Like, okay, this is going to take place in 1927 and go through to 1929. And so, you know, you look at the facts and that's how, that's how I situate it. And yeah. then, um, you know, other things like, for example, those camps in the Adirondacks, I wanted to change some of, some of those details. I wanted to, you know, make that work for the story. And so I changed the name of the camp and fictionalized it, but a lot of the details, and that's why I put the historical note in the back to say, like, this is, this is what, this is the place that inspired it, but it's the rest of it's fictionalized. Um, yeah. And then the people themselves, you know, that's all fictionalized, but obviously, like I was saying, Olive was sparked by a real person, and I did go researching, saying, okay, what else can I find about her? But there wasn't very much to go on, so it was really just the idea of her and that first glimmer um, yeah. of a real person. Yep. Oh, we got a little frozen again, but I, I think you're coming back. You're coming back. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so another question, what do you, what advice do you have for writers trying to break into publishing? I, did you ask how I got into publishing? Like, no, what, what advice do you have for writers who are trying to break in? Cause I think we have some writers on the. Oh on yeah. The too. Yeah. And there, you know, I think that's, people appreciate that question too. Definitely. Well, one of the things that's been most helpful to me with my writing, not necessarily with the publishing, but with my writing, is I'm a member of a writing workshop. And we used to meet, in, when I lived in New York, we would meet every Thursday night in person, and we would share pages with what we were working on. And it was just, it's, it's, and so now it's on Zoom, and now I moved to California, so it's still on Zoom, so it's great. great. That's good, yeah. But having that, like, uh, that group, and that's, like, that sort of, like, deadline for myself as well I'm like okay I've got to get my pages done so I'm going to share them on Thursday night it just keeps the momentum going yes, and, I totally hear, and we read our stuff out loud we don't we don't send it around to each other to read in advance because who has time for that right, right. <laughs> we just read it out loud and then and I think I, that just really helps me hearing myself read it out loud and moving the story along so I, I would say find either a writing group or a couple friends who who are writing and just share pages um I think that really helps with the writing. And then as far as getting, you know, publishing and getting published, I mean, I, as far as finding an agent for me, I thought to myself, okay, who's, which books have I read that I liked <laughs> and, who, yeah. and which agents represent those authors? Because if I like them and they like them, maybe they'll like my writing. Right, um, right. So that's how I found my agent. Um, so that might be <laughs> one way. Yeah, no, and I, I agree about like the writer's group. And also reading work out loud, one of my editors once was like, you know, you should just read the entire book out loud because you'll be surprised at what 
like you pick up that you don't pick up when you're reading on the page, you know, yeah. that you're like, oh, that doesn't work at all. You know, so I, I, I so I try to do that every time now. Yes. And actually I'm listening to, um, I listen, I'm listening to the show girl on, on the, oh. being narr narrated on, it's on audible. And, um, I'm trying to listen to it all the way through. It's hard to listen to your own. Oh, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> okay, but I'm, I'm forcing myself to do it because I want to hear it all the way through. And actually I wish I'd read it out loud because I probably would have, you know, edited a few little things here and there. Oh, right. I know. I know. I, I can't. I can't get through the first chapter. I just cringed, the whole, even if the narrator is great, but I just, yeah, I have a hard time. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I would say for people wanting to get into publishing, I would say start going to, well, when, when they're happening more, start going to book events, book signings, yes. book stores, because first of all, you get to hear the writers talk about their process. And, and then the, usually the person interviewing them is someone who's like a book influencer or another author or agree. Yeah. And I, I think, and also just go up and introduce it by the book and introduce yeah, yourself the book. at the end just <laughs> creates a good feeling and then you know follow them on instagram and it just start to start to build your um your book community on instagram or facebook or wherever you're on social media yeah I, that's really good advice too i completely agree um and I, so i have one more question well it's actually two questions in one um and then i was going to take some questions so if you if anyone has questions um, you can put them in the chat, you can put them in the q and I'll keep an eye on both. Um, but do you Zoom with book clubs? Like oh, it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So <laughs> Nicola Zooms with book clubs so she can talk about her book. And then um, how, what, how can readers best stay in touch with you? So I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. And on both of those, uh, it's just at Nicola Harrison author. Awesome. Um, okay. So that's probably the best. Awesome. Also, I love hearing from readers. So if you read my book, you can um, reach out to me through my website and let me know what you think. <laughs> Lovely. Awesome. Um, Christine Mott. Hello, Christine. She's like comes all the time. She's awesome. Do you have any input on your book cover? It's gorgeous. I agree. It's totally gorgeous. Oh, thank you. I love the book cover too. I was so happy I'll with it. it yeah. Um, yes. So, so I, um, I had some input on this. They, they showed me a few different options and this was the one I loved the most. And so they went with it. So I was happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Montauk, which is, hold on, this one. Oh, I love that one too. Yeah, so this this one, um, they actually changed the cover. It, they, they sent out the ARCs, you know, the uh, advanced readers copies. And then um, one of the big bookstores said it didn't look historical enough on the previous cover. And so they asked them to change it. And so because they're a big bookstore, the publisher was like, okay, we'll listen to you. <laughs> and so they changed it and then they just had a few different options and there was a red dress and there was, her hair didn't look right. And so I, oh. I they probably were like, oh my God, please stop giving us your feedback. But I kept giving feedback and we eventually got to, got to I this. love it. I love the blue too. I think yeah, yeah it works it. really well. Um, Autumn Shaw asks, speaking of research, how do you organize your research? Oh gosh, I probably don't do it the right way. I probably I just, don't either. <laughs> I read and I read and I take notes in the notebook and uh, it's not very well organized, but I kind of don't want it to be. I mean, maybe, there's probably a better way to do this, but I kind of don't want it to be. I just want some of it to stay in my mind. Um, and then I can go back and refer to the notebook, but I try to just absorb as much of it as I can so that when I'm writing, it just, you just get that overall feeling. I mean, of course there are facts and details you have to go back to. And I will write in my notebook, you know, this cool, I'll write something that jumped out at me. I'll write down the detail and I'll write which book it was in. Yeah, um, yeah. But I end up buying a bunch of books. I, I, I go to the, to the library and I find a bunch of books that I like, but I end up buying them because I want to have them to be able to refer to like for the whole yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I try to get them used, but I want to be able to like put sticky notes in them and like, yeah, we're, yeah, that's so it's much. And then better. they just become part of that book. Like I, I, I mean, I, I don't ever really want to let them go because I feel like that was such a part of me for the whole year. I was referring to those books and those articles. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's so funny you said that because my husband the other day is like, 
we have so many research books to you. I'm like, we can't get rid of any of them. I need them. <laughs> to get a storage unit at some point when we've written like lots and lots of books. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's driving them crazy. I'm like, nope, they're staying. So, um, oh, uh, Ramsey Doran. Hi, Ramsey. Are you doing a book tour? Yes. So I've been doing a book tour. Um, started in Southern California at my local bookstore, Pages, which is in Manhattan Beach. And then I was down in Newport Beach, and then um, we went to Florida and Charleston, and uh, I have a few other events lined up. It's all listed on my website. Um, it's sort of ongoing. I feel like these yeah. times are weird times. We, we never know if we should get on a plane or not get on a plane. So it's like right, things right, right. as they as they evolve. <laughs> I'll keep it posted. It can be posted on my website. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, this is a good question. Carolyn Sylvester asks, did you go to a show on Broadway to experience the feel of? Well, um, I used to live in New York, so I always used to go to Broadway shows, but the um, one of the shows I went to most recently as I was wrapping up writing the show girl and I was, I think I was starting to go into editing mode. I went to see Moulin Rouge which came out on Broadway, which I've oh, always loved. Yes, that movie. perfect. Oh, it's so good. If you get a chance to go see it, go see it. I've always loved that movie with Nicole Me Kidman. Too. Yeah. But I couldn't believe that it hadn't been made into a Broadway show yet. So um, so that was really cool. And it was definitely in the same vibe. vibe. As yeah, yeah, totally. Um, oh, Tori Whitaker asked, without giving any spoilers, can you share some insight for revisions that your editor advised? Like, did the book change very much with revisions? Not too much. Um, they were small. Like, I, I remember, like, the character Olive has some brothers, and my editor was like, you know, you haven't really developed much with the brothers. I just kind of mentioned them. So yeah. we developed that a little bit more. I mean, they're not, like, a main part of the book, but they're in there. So it's like, so I just developed that a little bit more. Um, that was, it was that, that type of thing. It was no, nothing major. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's always, oh, but, oh go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, going back to the question about Broadway, to get into the mood, I told you about Moulin Rouge. I also, um, you know, in New York, there's all kinds of different events and parties and underground clubs. Yeah. So, you know, New York is, is so much. But um, I went with a friend to um, an, a, a, a 1920s speakeasy party Oh, cool. And we got all decked out. It was like anything in the name of research. We got all decked out in our <laughs> 20s year and our, we did our hair and makeup all 20s and we went out and drank, you know, prohibition cocktails and went dancing. It was, it was really fun. And <laughs> I was like, this is the fun part of, this is the really fun part of the research. That's really fun. Yeah, I would love that. <laughs> um, oh, Christine asked, did your title change? Was it, was it always the showgirl or did you have some, another title in mind? Oh, that's a good question. So I told you that at the beginning, I thought that this, I was going to write a book about the Adirondacks that took yeah. place at one of the great camps. So my, my file name was always the Adirondacks book. So the whole way through, I'm writing this book about the Ziegfeld Follies and the showgirls. And it's like, you know, it's not the Adirondacks book. They just go there for a portion of time. <laughs> and at the very end, um, because I had called it that the whole way through, I didn't have an, I didn't have a title. Oh, <laughs> so my editor actually came up with that title, The Showgirl. Yeah, it's perfect. It's simple, <laughs> tells the story, you know, gives a glimpse, yep. Um, it's funny how attached you get to things. Yes, totally. You know, also with the names of the characters, Olive and Archie, um, I mentioned that they were inspired by these real life people who owned the, uh, the camp up in the Adirondacks. And their first names were Olive and Archibald. And so as I was doing my research, I was just writing, okay, Olive and Archie, but I'll change it later. I'll change their names later. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, once I had written some of these chapters, I'm like, I'm so attached to them. I can't change their names now. I so, know they are who they are, right? In your head. Yeah, yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Um, a few people have asked, what are you working on now? Yeah, so I'm working on a book that takes place in the 1940s. So I've done the 20s with the showgirl and the 30s with Montauk and so now the 40s <laughs> just gonna work my way through the decades um so I found out in the past year that oh we froze but I'm hoping it's coming back please
Okay, is it frozen for the audience? I'm, you're frozen for me, Nicola, but that might not be it's frozen for the audience. Can someone type in the chat? Okay, you're back. <laughs> oh. Okay. There we go. What was the I forgot the question. Um, I know, I know. Um, oh, um, what you're working on. Oh, yes. Okay. So I found out that my husband's grandmother used to be a Rosie the Riveter. And she, oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, that's, you know, it's in the family. So, um, so she worked at an airplane factory in Los Angeles. So, um, so I kind of am starting this story there. It's, but what's, what's, what I found interesting about that, about these women who came and took these roles in the, in the factories during the war, is that they, you know, they took these jobs that were traditionally men's jobs and they did them and they did them well. And then the men came back from war and everyone was like, all right, ladies, thanks yeah. very much. Go back to being a housewife, <laughs> you know. I know, that was unbelievable to me. Yeah. yeah I know. So, um, so I'm picking up right there when the war is over. And um, I have a character who's been working in the factory and she's told, you know, thank you, goodbye. And she has to figure out what she's going to do with her life. So she ends up down in Laguna Beach in Southern California, which is an artist community. And she wor starts working for a very eccentric, famous artist and gets, you know, very involved in the art world down there. And um, so that's what I'm working on now. It's fun. Oh, very cool. And do you have a d pub date for that yet or not yet? It's going to be 2023. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just around the corner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, I was just thinking, tell, um, tell people about Montauk a little bit for readers who aren't familiar with the, with the book. Oh yeah, sure. So Montauk, this one takes place in the summer of 1938. And it's the story of Beatrice Bordeaux. And she's spending the summer in Montauk. Um, she has an unstable marriage, not going too well. Um, her husband wants her to stay out in Montauk for the summer with at the Montauk Manor, which is where all the wives stay and the husbands go back and forth to the city. And he wants her to get in with all these wives because it will be good for business. Um, but instead she finds herself getting in with, you know, feeling more comfortable with the locals. And um, so that causes some problems. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It all takes place in that one summer of 1938. And um, yeah, I used to, I used to have a house out in Montauk and I used to see, I loved it. It was a very quaint fishing village. And the more time I spent out there, I started seeing some of the mom and pop shops selling out and new places coming in. And I felt a change happening and it yeah. was like a cool place to be as opposed to this, you know, little remote fishing village that it used to be. And so it made me nostalgic for how it used to be. And so I, I wanted to write about Montauk when people first started going out there. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to read uh, a couple of comments too, before we go. I, I'll, Ramsey Dorn said, I have the audible version of this and it will accompany me on a bike ride from Pittsburgh to DC. And it's an all woman bike ride. So it's very appropriate. Listening. Oh, how cool is <laughs> that? Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> so nice. And um, Christine Mott said she loved Montauk, the novel. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so nice. Um, and, oh, there was another question. Oh, Jerry McCarenda asks, how did you go from London to the MFA program in Stony Brook? And did getting the degree help your writing, help you make contacts, or both? Okay. So, yeah, I know it's funny sometimes you think of, like, how did an English girl start writing about historical fiction about in, in the states um so i moved to england when i was four i moved from england to california when i was 14 with my family and then you know went to college at ucla and then i wanted to i wanted to write right away and i i studied english and creative writing but i had a um like a mentor in college her name was carolyn c she's actually lisa c oh yes yeah yeah, okay. yeah. and um and she was, she was so great. She was such a great mentor. And one of the things she said, she said, don't try starting to write your novel right out of college. You've ha you have nothing to say yet. <laughs> you know? You're going to live a little. <laughs> live a little, get a job, move somewhere, have some relationships, break up. You know? and then right, you right. That's good advice. Yeah. But I really wanted to write. But that, so I, I moved to New York to get into magazine publishing. I figured I'd write like that for a while. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and then ended up living in New York for 17 years until just very recently moved back to California. So I was working in magazines, 
right, doing fashion journalism. And I would, but I was always taking a creative writing class on the side, always a night class or a weekend seminar or something. And then finally I was, I, and then they, uh, they had a summer conference with, with Stony Brook, which is out in Southampton. And um, it was like a 10 day writers conference. And I went to that. And then when I was there, I learned about the MFA program, which you, which you could do part time in the oh, city. Nice. So I was like, you know, I'm taking all these writing classes anyway. I should just get my MFA. <laughs> yeah, make it into something. Right, right. <laughs> oh, so that's I did, cool. and it was really great. Um, I think what helped me the most, what I got the most out of, was just getting into a consistent writing schedule, writing on a regular basis, um, yes. and learning to, you know, workshop your work, get feedback from other people, give feedback and receive feedback, and you know, that yes. that whole process is all part of the writing game. Um, Totally. And I, and also just, you know, the people who were teaching us were authors, real life authors out in the world doing their thing. And, and they became like real people to me. And it sort of made me think, all right, these are, it's not like some mystical figure out there. <laughs> right. like, yeah, yeah. And they're really nice and helpful. And, you know, maybe I could be an author one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I, one thing that I loved about like getting on the other side of publishing and getting published five years ago, it's like, people are, authors are really supportive of one another and to writers coming up. And that's, I love that. That's amazing. I've been blown away by people's kindness in this Me industry. Me too. Me yeah. too. I don't know if every industry is lucky enough to have that, but I mean, people, yeah, writers really support each other and boost each other and, and post about their and talk about their friends' books and yeah, yeah, it's really nice. I think because part of it is because it's such a hard, you know, it's a hard and it's crazy. <laughs> Publishing is crazy. So I think like we all kind of know it and kind of try to boost each other up and, you yeah. know, help each other out, which is good. And it's, and it's also like a mutual admiration. I mean, like we read, we all read each other's books too. Yes, that's yeah, that's true. true. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, to wrap up, um, why don't you tell people again your your Instagram and Facebook contact info and reminder that you um you do do book clubs on Zoom so yeah absolutely so uh, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook it's just my name Nicola Harrison author and you can also reach me through my website which is just nicolaharrison.com and I'd love to hear from you guys well, thank you so much. This was so great. It was lovely to meet you over Zoom and maybe someday in New York, we'll meet in person. That would yes. be- Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. This was so fun. Thanks everyone for all of your questions. Yeah, thank yeah. you, take care. Thanks, bye. Bye, good night.